Okay, well, as is typical of the skull events and other events of this ilk, uh, I have torn up all my notes, uh, literally, uh, because I had dinner last night with a friend, uh, Judith Roden, from the Rockefeller Foundation, suddenly reminded me that, in fact, what I want to talk about is the big disruption, the elephant in the room, and we do have precedents for that. We have, uh, we have a way forward where we can say, yes, it has been done, it can be done again at an even bigger scale. So I am actually going to be talking a little bit about the giant elephant, the system that all of our heroes uh, bravely rage against. I mean, one of the things that has been a, a moving uh, event in my life is becoming involved with social enterprise because I discovered soon in my career I didn't actually have a tribe. Uh, the scientists, I was, I was a pretty good scientist, really, but I just didn't feel at home there because the reason I was doing science and the reason they were doing science, the incentives, the rewards, didn't really align. Then I got into the development industry and I thought I was going to die. This is definitely not for me. Uh, so there am I, tribeless, and then I got this call. I feel like the Ziegfeld Follies lineup, right? And so Pamela calls me and says, well, you too could join. And I, and I thought, yeah, all right. And I remember my first meeting at the, the foundation. Um, and it was really like a 12-step program going in there and saying, hi, you know, I'm a molecular biologist. And they said, okay, you're good. Go okay, have, have a cup of bad coffee. And, uh, <laughs> and then I discovered the finest human beings I had ever known in my life, and I discovered I had a tribe. And it was a very, very uplifting experience because to this day, they don't really know what I do, but they like that I do it. Uh, <laughs> so considering, considering the countdown timer is going to ensure that that doesn't change today, <laughs> I will make an open offer to any of you who want to hear much more about what I do, that if you buy me a drink, I will tell you uh, ad nauseum, uh, literally ad nauseum, <laughs> if you buy me the wrong kind of drink. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, the big system, the big dog that we, uh, we don't refer to very much, and we should, and that's the innovation system. Uh, if there are economists in the room, which seems a, a certainty, uh, what I'll be talking about is the enormous biological imperative that drives everything. We talk often and glibly about human rights, but the truth is all of those are follow-ons from a much more interesting and biological imperative. And I'm going to tell you a little story that brings this to the fore. Um, in November of 1960, a, uh, a young English woman, a secretarial college graduate, was sitting having lunch in a forest and noticing uh, her colleagues having lunch. And one of them, David, was eating termites. And she thought, <laughs> she thought this is amazing. So she sent a telegram back to her uh, mentor. And that wouldn't be so remarkable, except that the woman was Jane Goodall. And the colleague she was watching was David Graybeard, a chimpanzee. And in so eating termites, he had constructed a tool. When Jane referred this back to Louis Leakey, her mentor, his response, which was comparably exciting and actually shattered the field of primatology and much of anthropology, was actually an object lesson about DNA, that in the DNA of primates, of us, is this imperative, not a right, not even an inclination, but an imperative to innovate to envision, to create, to make, to use, and critically, to benefit from the use of a tool. That really is the descriptor of primates and of us. And since a common ancestor emerged uh, that gave rise to uh, David and ourselves, that has been the driver of the development of our civilizations, our societies, our institutions, uh, and their misfunctions, and their dysfunction now. As you can imagine, if there is a fundamental driver to solve problems, to have your own skin in the game, that driver is both a powerful reason to persist as a society, but it's also a powerful target for the dark side. If you want to control in a society, there is no better way to control than to suppress, harness, or completely uh, deny this fundamental imperative, the biological imperative of innovation. And that is what we developed. Over the last millennia, we have developed, on the one hand, with the good angel, the capability of inspiring and empowering innovation. For the first several thousand years, this was through exploration of the natural world, the space that we live in, through, through trade, through, through uh, innovation based on exploration. But latterly, this has been through the use of the most remarkable invention in the history of our species, which is science. The downside, the dark side of innovation, is that in both of those activities, constraining this imperative to innovate has been a powerful tool for securing power, prestige, and privilege. 
And what I'll describe to you is that my real goal is to make social enterprise go away. We should have no more such meetings in 10 years because all enterprise should be intrinsically social or social capable. This should be an evanescent. <laughs> and it can be done. This is a huge, inexorable juggernaut of a system, and it can be changed. So let me describe one example in history where it has been. In fact, one should think that we're all, all should be speaking Portuguese today, if not for the Dutch. Okay, here's the, here's the story there. From the 1400s up to the late 1500s, uh, long-distance maritime commerce was dominated by the Portuguese, and to some extent the Spanish. Mostly the Portuguese, it makes a better story. And um, they had mastered navigation, they had mastered cartography. They had sent, over and over, they would send their explorers out to survey, to find the features of the natural world, the, the seaways, the coasts, the reefs, the shoals, the currents, the continents, and to bring that knowledge back secretly, where it could be assembled into decision support tools, maps. When they did this, and they maintained it very, very secretively, they alone were able to cyclically build on that knowledge until they knew how to get to the East and the West Indies, and no one else did. The tool that was so important to them, and so important to the future of civilization, is the map. So think about the map for a minute. What is a map? You like to think of it as a map is something which tells you where to go, but it doesn't. It actually de-risks your choices. A map is not a direction where to go, it's a, a tool that allows you to lower the risk involved in your journey. If I give you a map of London, the tube map for instance, it presupposes nothing about where you will go on your journey, but it is an essential tool for you to take that journey. The map is the ultimate tool of investment because it de-risks a process. Now, in 1595, something most remarkable happened. A Dutch merchant, traveler, I don't know what you'd call him back then, an entrepreneur named Jan Huygens van Linschoden was working for the Portuguese governor of Goa in India. And you know, this is very cinematic, I could imagine. Stumbling in the back rooms of the, of the governor's mansions, he discovered the entire lore of Portuguese cartography of 150 years of the surveys and maps and the portolans that indicated how to get between this strait and that strait and this shoal and that reef. And he did the logical, pragmatic Dutch thing. Well, that's repetitious. Uh, he copied them. <laughs> So he copied them, and then in a very Indiana Jones with, with wrecks, shipwrecks, and deserts, and bandits, and everything, took him two years to get back to Amsterdam, where he did the totally non-Dutch thing. So instead of selling this treasure trove to a Dutch merchant house, he published it, open access. Now this was post-Gutenberg, so once you made the book, it was there. And it was before copyright, so no lawyers. So the year it was published, the year it was published saw a stimulation of enterprise that had never happened in our history before. Before that, the Portuguese and Spanish had exercised a de facto Iberian monopoly over long-distance maritime commerce. The ships were slow and miserable. The navigation tools were pathetic. Um, investment tools were limited. Insurance was largely non-existent. And risk was high because all of the surveys were their own. 1596, when the Itinerario was published, the Dutch East India Company was formed, and the British East India Company was formed. Whew. So in one year, basically, the monopoly was destroyed. And over the next 50 years, a massive explosion of investment, of tools, of de-risking, of, of new types of ships and navigation. In fact, the world changed so dramatically because the commonality of the tools of de-risking innovation became a public good. Pretty soon it became inexorable that maps would get better when the Dutch maps were added to the English maps, which were added to the Portuguese and the Spanish maps, and later the French and the Germans. And eventually, all maps were aggregated into a substantially accurate tool to de-risk the natural world. Here there be dragons was a matter of history. So that's the map. What happened after that? Science happened after that. Right around the time all this explosion was happening, Newton, over the road, was starting a revolution that has changed everything, absolutely everything. Whereas before, the human innovative spirit was discovering the value of place, where things are, you know, what is there. Everything that happened in science since the 1700s was really about how does it work? And passing through now the gamut not of place, but of what? How does the natural law of 
physics or of biology, how can it shape technology and the development of that? And interestingly enough, the biggest problem faced by those people was secrecy. How could someone who discovers a new process, invents a new spring, a new chronometer, how can they benefit from that? Well, traditionally, by manufacturing it themselves and not telling anyone. But there's a Latin word, patere, which has evolved into a very unusual institution, patents. That was invented by my illustrious forebear, Thomas Jefferson, in the United States in 1790, specifically, hey, <laughs> dad told me he was, uh, uh, specifically to tease into public view these inventions. So he's making this begrudging compromise, saying, if you will simply tell us what you know, we will give you the right to benefit from it for a small amount of time. Now, what he did not anticipate was that an invention at that time was also a product, but that in 100 years, in the next 200 years, inventions, the iPhone, this cool thing, whatever it is, uh, will involve 1,000 pieces of technology. And this is in my last, <laughs> last time. I'm going to you, leave you with a vision of what can be done and what is being done. Envision a jigsaw puzzle. Now, most of you have children, and many of the rest of you were children. And when you were, <laughs> you assembled jigsaw puzzles. Now, jigsaw puzzles have four rules by which they must be, uh, must be undertaken. And these are the same four rules for making things, products, vaccines, crops, uh, iPhones, uh, fabrics. Anything that you touch and see has passed through the same rules of jigsaws. First, don't lose the box. Don't lose the box. You have to be able to envision the product. You have to be able to envision this thing. You lose the box, you're screwed, OK? <laughs> Ever had someone hand you a baggie full of bits and say, make it? <laughs> no, no. The other thing, you got to assume most of the pieces are there. Maybe 10% can go down the heater vent or the dog can eat them. But basically, if you're not reasonably confident when you pull this out of the bottom drawer that more or less the pieces are there, you don't set out to build this puzzle. So it's got to be reasonably comprehensive. You can color some in and have a few, few holes in there. Oh, that was Nemo. Uh, but it's OK. Rule three, rule three, start from something you know. Everyone in innovation and everyone in jigsaw puzzles does that. We start in the corners and the edges. We all do. It's not cheating. It's OK. If somebody has left a bolus of jigsaw puzzle pieces together, oh, silly me, look at that. And you pop it down and you start from something you know. You all do it. The fourth rule. This is like Spanish Inquisition. The fourth rule is the comfy chairs. <laughs> the fourth rule is that it's OK. Don't despair. It's, they actually are supposed to fit together. Uh, there's only six or seven shapes in a jigsaw puzzle, not 1,000. If you have a huge jigsaw puzzle of 1,000 pieces, it's not 1,000 different shapes. It's a half a dozen. So don't despair. <laughs> or Douglas Adams would have something to say about that. Don't panic. The same is true with innovation. Now, in the last 200 years, what's happened from Thomas Jefferson's idea of the patent, where a mousetrap or a cotton gin merited a single document that it could exclude others, now virtually everything we aspire to do and everything we need to democratize in the use of science to make products and services has been fragmented, fragmented like a jigsaw puzzle into thousands and thousands of pieces. This year, almost half a million patents were applied for in China alone. Each country now building this enormous, inexorable volume of no. Because a patent is the right to sue, not the right to do. It doesn't actually give you any capability to make a thing. It only gives you a queering the pitch role. And this is a very, very substantial issue. If we want to democratize the use of science, what we have to do is create a global cyber infrastructure that allows all of us, not just lawyers, to begin to parse and understand and assemble maps like Van Linskoten basically enabled of worldwide cartography. So, I'm, hey, it has to stop moving uh, at zero. Um, <laughs> I was expecting there'd be this sort of negative thing that is like the likelihood of ever getting invited back. Um, so, so it, what I, I should have stuck with the notes. What I wanted to say was that 50 years ago, there was a precedent for modest, in, modest investment causing a massive disruption of what felt like an inexorable system, and that was the Green Revolution. Irrespective of whether you admire it or decry it, it was amongst the most powerful interventions ever made by philanthropy. A modest investment, there are probably a billion people alive now that would not have been alive had that investment not been made, but it was through the final issue. It was through enabling problem solving, a new type of problem solving. So if I have to leave, I, which I probably do because they turned it off, um, <laughs> it would be with this. The problem to solve is the problem of problem solving. It's not about 
making a new vaccine. It's not about making a new crop or a new surface or an iPhone. It's about figuring out how to enable a broader demographic of problem solvers. If we keep thinking that there will be experts of roughly my albedo fixing other people's problems, we're never going to get off the treadmill. We are never going to get away from celebrating the people who are champions in this inexorably wretched system. What we have to do is change the system to democratize the ability to access the best and brightest, the, the capital tools, the de-risking tools, to convince investors that a little investment can yield an acceptable return because the risk is low. So our recommendation to you, and through the work we've done in developing the lens with investments initially from the Rockefeller Foundation, is that this could be Van Linschoten's revolution. It's time to bring the world of intellectual property and de-risking to become a digital public good where anyone, anywhere, in any language can work with anyone else to create a map of one port, of one domain, of solar cells, of vaccines, of rice plants that perform better in their paddock, and democratize the craft of problem solving. So what I have to leave you with, it's about the demographics of problem solving. If we want to not have this meeting in 10 years, we have to solve that by democratizing the ability of people to work together to de-risk the investment landscape and to de-risk the science-enabled innovation landscape. So innovation cartography. We've set out to do it in the last three or four years, and it's just been launched in the last uh, couple of months, in a soft launch, so don't kill our servers. But it's the beginning of that process. So I'm, I'm way overdone. Thank you very much. Yeah.